Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh my dear brothers and sisters and friends and foes and welcome to another episode of the Blood Brothers podcast with your host Didi Hussain. Before I introduce today's guest I want to remind all the avid podcast listeners that you can find this show all three seasons on all the major audio platforms and if you're watching on YouTube don't be cheeky click subscribe to the Five Pillars YouTube channel. Today's guest is joining us after three and a half years in person mashallah tabarakallah. Um, he actually needs no introduction but I will give him a very brief one anyway. He is a celebrated and esteemed UK rapper, activist and pundit and that's not, none other than our brother Loki, aka Kareem or the other way around. <laughs> Asalaamu Alaikum. Alaikum Asalaam. Thank you very much for having me bro. I yeah. appreciate it. And I would just say it's, you know, it's important in this time of shrinking um, space for platforms that engage critically with the way power functions in our society for people to support Five Pillars. There are many stories that I have not seen covered anywhere else, but I have seen covered on Five Pillars. So I definitely encourage people to support the platform. Exactly, okay, my bro. Let me kick you off with the fact that we're here in the UK, 17 days since the events of the 7th of October. And things feel different, Kareem. Well, I'm telling you, uh, post 9-11, post 7-7, uh, post Woolwich, post ISIS beheadings, there was always a reaction from the UK government in terms of their rhetoric, in terms of policies, in terms of uh, everyday Islamophobia, the spike that we see. But this time around, it feels very different. Do you agree? And if yes, why is that? Absolutely, I agree. You have hardcore ideologues in control of the Home Office, less so in control of the Foreign Office. But unfortunately, I think what we have underestimated throughout these years is the extent to which Israeli intelligence has been able to integrate fully with British intelligence. You know, there was a time when Margaret Thatcher, for example, after the killing of Palestinian cartoonist Najila Ali in London by Palestinians who were working for Israeli intelligence, mm -hmm. Margaret Thatcher actually expelled the Mossad agents from England and kicked out the entirety of the Mossad base, as far as I understand. We are a long way from anything like that in terms of the way that our society is structured today. So, for example, the way our society is structured today, you have the police, when they hack phones or they hack the clouds of people, they use technology from a company called Celebrite. Now, Celebrite was set up by alumni of Unit 8200 in Israel Signals Intelligence Unit. It's the most prestigious unit that Israel has actually, following a policy that Netanyahu initiated in 2012. Now, this policy was covered by Calculus Tech um, after the fact, and the article states that it passed through the Israeli military censor. So it was information that the Israeli military was okay with making public. Now, this policy was to move figures from Unit 8200 into private companies. It's from there that you get companies like NSO Group. It's from there that you get, that gave us the Pegasus spyware. It's from there that you get organizations like Black Cube. Hold on, so simpleton, now, simpleton terms, you've got legit Israeli mukhabarat now yeah. going into the private sector Precisely. that are now carrying out these services under these company umbrellas to British companies, British organisations, British institutions. It gets worse. So when we're talking about Unit 8200, let's establish the facts. Whistleblowers from within this unit have come out and said that the Israeli um, agents in this unit spy on Palestinian electronic communications and use it as compromat. They use it to blackmail Palestinians into becoming collaborators. This has been documented by The Guardian and others. Mm -hmm. Now, the interesting point here is that an organization has existed for several years called the UK Israel Tech Hub. The UK Israel Tech Hub is funded by the British Foreign Office, is funded by the British Department for Trade, and it is stationed within the British Embassy in Israel. Who is the UK Israel Tech Hub staffed by? It's staffed by former Israeli military and intelligence personnel, and it's headed by a gentleman by the name of Haim Shani, who is the former director of Israel's finance ministry. What does the UK Israel Tech Hub do? It works to procure public sector contracts in Britain mm -hmm. for Israeli tech companies that are often staffed by Unit 8200 people. And so what you have is this company, Celebrite, carrying out the phone hacking for the British police. In addition to that, you have, and, and, and incidentally, 
Celebrite is headed by Haim Shani, the very person that heads the Israel lobby group that's funded by the British government to procure these contracts in the first place. So without getting too caught in the weeds, what I'm saying to you here... There's a lot of conflict of interest, and one would say synergy in interests. Precisely. And interestingly, you are talking about the an issue of sovereignty. And this is something that even somebody like Margaret Thatcher, while she sold off so many vital functions of the British state, whether it's British gas, whether it's eventually Royal Mail down mm. the line, it wasn't her specifically that did that, whether it's uh, the, the water, with all the main uh, functions of the state were sold off to private interest by Margaret, Margaret Thatcher. But one thing she understood was the sovereignty issue when it came to the operations of Israeli intelligence on British soil. That now is not the case at all with any of the political elite that we have. Let's look at them one by one. We look at Priti Patel, for example. When she was Home Secretary, she had 13 meetings with the Israeli... Well, no, she was... Um, she met she was Home Secretary. She was Home Secretary at the time. She met with Israeli officials, including Netanyahu, behind the back of her own government. Yep. Let's look at Rishi Sunak, for example. Now, the company Infosys, which his uh, father-in-law founded, which his family are still deeply invested in and have influence within, actually has a, uh, a director who is from Unit 8200 also. Now, Unit 8200 also has numerous companies that are subsidiaries, so individuals from this unit have uh, companies which are subsidiaries of Infosys also. So anyone looking at that picture, let's assume that Rishi Sunak had a company and the director of it was former, former Russian intelligence, for example. Mm -hmm. There would be a problem. There'd be a national uproar. Precisely. And, and, he, and he would be considered uh, An not, agent. not fit yeah. to, be, to be prime minister because of that uh, conflict of interest. So you have various ways in which Britain, you know, it has a secret military agreement with Israel that it hasn't uh, allowed the public to know about. It has, for example, 100 companies that have offices in this country who sell military equipment to Israel. The key thing also here is, according to international humanitarian law, when making a sale of arms to a state, you have to know that it could not, that it, could if not it could may be used in violations of international humanitarian law, yeah. law, then you cannot make that sale. That's according to the Arms Trade Treaty, mm -hmm. which Britain is a signator to. Britain consistently, when it comes to Israel, violates that. It does it with one or two other states as well. But the issue here that we're talking about is that Britain is working hand in glove with Israel lobby groups and directly with the Israeli government to squash any type of critical thinking as far as schools go, as far as universities go, and as far as the public sphere, which we are part of, to try and crush our ability to reveal the crimes that Israel is visiting upon the Palestinians and has visited upon them historically. And we can't forget also the role that Britain played in the development of Zionism. You know, at the time when you look at the issuing of the Balfour Declaration, the part of the reason why the idea took such... Um, took such a hold of the, the British political elite was thanks to Chaim Wiseman. Now, Chaim Wiseman was a chemist in Manchester, um, well known, but essentially a bit of a marginal figure until he came up with the Wiseman process. So in World War I... Where can people read about this? So we're not so we're not accused of uh, anti-Semitic Jewish conspiracies? No, no, all of, this is, all of this is publicly accessible. There's nothing I'm saying which is not... Um, publicly accessible information. Um, so Chaim Wiseman at that time was militating for the idea, you know, Theodore Herzl had died in uh, 1904, 1905, depending on the, uh, the narrative that you believe. But Chaim Wiseman had taken on the mantle of pushing uh, the Zionist uh, movement alongside Ben-Gurion and others. And in Britain, during World War I, you had, for the first two years of World War I, a conglomerate of British and German companies who were arms companies, meaning that British companies benefited when German bullets 
killed Kinder British Sons. people, yep. and German companies Vice benefited versa. when British yeah. companies killed British bullets killed German people. Now, halfway through World War One, that was broken off. Okay, in 1916, and so at that time, Britain needed a, a formula to produce smokeless gunpowder, and this is where. Um, Chaim Wiseman came in with acetone and the, the, the way he could produce this stuff through the use of, of starchy stuff like potatoes. And this was considered a real game-changing innovation. And uh, Winston Churchill, who I remember was, uh, I think, Minister of Munitions at the time, um, was greatly enamored with it. Um, Lloyd George, who also had a high position in government but wasn't prime minister quite at that time, they, they were very, very um, uh, impressed by what Chaim Wiseman had come with. So you're saying the guy who resumed the Zionist movement after Theodore Herzl also happened to be the guy who first found or created smokeless ammunition? A, a method for creating smokeless ammunition, which was applied not only in Britain, but in the United States and in Canada. So w I guess what I'm trying to um, illustrate is that the, the battle bonds and the bonds in terms of weapons manufacturing that exists between not only Britain and the Zionist movement, but also Britain and Israel are deep. You know, they, they precede the state by a long way. And so after that, um, Wiseman moved to Holland Park. He would, he would host... Um, uh, Brit British politicians and then you know I remember reading about him writing the Balfour Declaration for Arthur Balfour let's be clear it was written by Zionist lobbyist Chaim Wiseman um, Balfour merely reproduced it and sent it to Lord Rothschild and at that point Britain had a fear that the Germans were going to issue a similar type of pronouncement and so they wanted to beat them to it mm -hmm. um, they believed that there were certain benefits they could get from making that uh, move and and then you have Herbert Samuel who was the first British High Commissioner of Palestine after the British mandate of Palestine was established now an interesting fact about Herbert Samuel is that both his son and the two really key movers in the Zionist movement, Vladimir Jabotinsky and Ben Gurion, were in the same unit in the British Army in World War One. And um, Herbert Samuel then had the uh, obligation to implement the Balfour Declaration, which meant establishing the foundation of the apartheid state, which meant establishing separate institutions for people in Palestine, depending on their religious identity. And so then that led us to the point where the the other side of it is the division of labor which was a, a, a different issue you know when you look at the first zionist um enterprises and settlements in the late 1800s one of the problems that was seen with it, it's referred to the first second and the third alia the first alia was seen as a failure by some in the zionist movement because it employed palestinians to till the soil and they saw a necessity to build this um this uh, this it. supremacist state would be the division of labor, meaning that the Zionist um, uh, uh, colonialists would have to learn how to till the soil themselves and have to as work opposed, as opposed to relying on the Palestinians. Precisely, and um, and so then that with the second alia and the third, it was a different situation, and so what you had is simultaneously the drive for the division of labour, which led to this perception of a sort of muscular kibbutzism, but then on the other side you had the British establishing separate institutions, and across that period, let's not forget the British were the ones that established the demolishing of houses for punitive reasons. Um, thousands of Palestinian homes were demolished by the British. It's the British that established the use of Palestinians as human shields by using them as minesweepers. And it's the British in 1936 when you had the longest Palestinian, the longest strike in recorded human history was led by the Palestinians in 1936. And what happened was the British, particularly Ord Wingate at that time, uh, uh, significant figure in the British military helped set up what were these night squads which were Zionist gangs that would work with him to suppress the Palestinian population. 
and um and in that way in a way he established the sort of skeletal structure of what would become the israeli military but what you also have is the stern gang jabotinsky influence side of the zionist movement which fought the british tooth and nail you have the king david hotel bombing you have the killing of british soldiers and booby trapping their bodies mm -hmm. these organizations were explicitly defined as terrorists according to british law at but, the time. But, but would you say that all that was collateral damage for the wider goal of establishment of the zionist entity i think from because we hear that quite common all the zionists also commit acts of terrorism against the british mandate yes are you saying that that is seems more of a collateral damage that had to happen uh for the wider goal of the establishment of the zionist entity yeah i mean the ben Gurion side were essentially invested in the british presence and they clearly chose the british side when uh second world war was happening the jabotinsky side or the side that slightly split off it which is the stern gang lehi they actively did not they wrote letters to the nazis in germany asking to join the war on their side mm -hmm. you know when we talk about zionist fascism let's be clear there's more streets there's more cinemas there's more hospitals there's more sc schools in the political entity of israel today named after vladimir Jamp jabotinsky than there is named after theodore herzl for example okay now jabotinsky was directly inspired by the fascists in ukraine inspired by mussolini mm -hmm. for example um and so this fascistic impulse that exists in zionism is not is not new it's not a development that's only happened with smotrich and but netanyahu and ben gavir it's something that's really deeply deeply ingrained in the zionist movement and this idea as jabotinsky had it and actually both ben gurion and jabotinsky were far more honest than others they said very clearly the palestinians are the indigenous to this land we are colonizers in order for us to uh, fulfill our colonial ambitions we have to in the case of Jabotinsky he said build an iron wall you know Jabotinsky was very honest he said we have to no no uh, no native population will accept alien invaders so that was that was what he said mm -hmm. right that was what he said and so really when you look at Gaza it's actually the implementation of the idea of the iron wall that Jabotinsky had and so now we're in a situation where israel has the stated intention of two things driving millions of palestinians into the sinai desert in egypt and as we will get into later on the show the demolishing of the two masjids in so, al-aqsa given that very uh sinister picture you've presented which i don't doubt for a moment uh, and one that you're saying actually predates the events of 7th of October, predates uh, Oslo, Camp David, 73, 67, 48. Now that we're seeing the reaction of the UK government and the picture that you've set out, how does, the, how does that affect the everyday grassroots activists who's been getting visits from the police, officer, police officers about the flag hanging from their window or for a social media that, a post that they made on LinkedIn? Um, how does that how those things linked this is the application of something that has been established as a practice by the israelis on palestinians to external theaters so for example the palestinian prisoner studies center found that you had 500 palestinians over the course of three years in prison for social media posts and some of them were children since the 7th of october you've seen a hundred Israeli citizens, we don't know if those are Palestinian Israeli citizens, but we know they're Israeli citizens mm -hmm. who have been imprisoned for social media posts. So this mentality, you know, the same way that my music was targeted on the basis of incitement, that's the very same thing that is aimed at Palestinians in, uh, in occupied Palestine by the Israelis, incitement on social media. You know, for instance, you have the case of Darin Tatur, a Palestinian poet. She wrote the poem, Qawim Hum Ya Sha'bi Qawim Hum. She spent around a year in prison, three years on uh, house arrest. Translate that. Uh, resist them, my people resist them. Now she, when she entered the prison, she was told by the Israeli jailers, 
you will not have a pencil, especially you will not have a pencil. So what she did is she used the zip from her jacket to write her poetry on the wall of her cell. Now, when Darin Tatur was released, she was given an award by Oxfam. Um, you know, however, her case has not been examined much in English language media, and it certainly hasn't been viewed as something which is illustrative of a wider uh, problem. There's examples of Palestinians writing things on Facebook like, forgive me, forgive me. And not long after it, that person, their house was raided and they were arrested by the Israelis because they had translated forgive me to something else in Hebrew. You have cases of people writing things on social media which are in no way threatening to anyone and them facing some type of punitive process for it. Let's remember that the Palestinians are processed in Israeli military courts. Israelis are processed in Israeli civilian courts. The Israeli military courts have a, a prosecution rate of literally 99.8%. Uh, um, you have seen... Uh, thousands of Palestinians arrested, children as young as 12 yep. arrested for throwing stones. Younger. Which, younger than 12, precisely. Than Just that. several days ago, you yeah. saw a three-year-old Palestinian arrested on the basis that they were trying to get his father yep. to hand himself in. These are things that are all documented. Are it's you saying this has now been rolled out now? A similar system of surveillance and cracking down on dissent and just merely voicing an alternative perspective that the Palestinians face under the Israeli entity is now being rolled out in the UK or a similar type of uh, intelligence gathering and monitoring. We live in a society where implicit unfreedoms have been dominant for many, many years. Mm -hmm. We live in a society where people were blacklisted in the construction industry for attempting to unionize, for complaining about health and safety. We live in a society where a thousand political groups were infiltrated by spy cops. Um, you're talking about groups like uh, uh, Wales Vegan Organization. You're talking about uh, an organization in Scotland that rescued hedgehogs. I mean, it sounds ridiculous, but these are the organizations that have been infiltrated by spy cops by the British government, including, you look at, for instance, Rachel Corrie's family. I mean, obviously mm. she's not from, she's not from uh, the, uh, the Britain, but when she was killed in Gaza by a bulldozer, you had her family spied on. But not only that, the people that were involved in her organization here were infiltrated and spied on. So these things have always been here but I think what we're talking about now is the social engineering of the Muslim community. And I think particularly on Israel, it's sharper than on any other issue. Absolutely. And, and that entails, and that entails... What does that mean for Masajid the Madrasas and our, our children going to schools? So, so what it entails is it entails an older generation being engaged in the Masajid and being told, we would like these particular groups to come in and visit you and perhaps have an iftar together or something like that. In those cases, the organizations that are likely to come in mm -hmm. would be the Board of Deputies. Now, the Board of Deputies in its trustees report in 2020... Notorious, these guys. Notorious, put in, nice. Absolutely, and put in the following sentence. We have a close working relationship with the Israeli embassy and strengthened links with the IDF spokesman's department and the Ministry of Strategic Affairs at the time when it existed. They've and never TV. hidden this fact, though. They, they, they haven't hidden it as such, but what I think they've done is laundered their influence through other organizations. So you'll have Nisat Nashim, for example. Absolutely, which uh, Julie Sadiq, remember, was involved in. Who, who's been briefed by the Ministry of Defense yeah. on, on Britain's foreign policy. Yeah. But in terms of the Board of Deputies, we're talking about them uh, developing this at Nashim, incubating it in their own words, right? So these are the type of engagement things that at least have been rolled out uh, previously, certainly will be intensified, certainly will have got a lot more funding recently. What about CST? Community Security Trust. Well, CST is very highly connected within the British establishment. It's founded by a convicted fraudster, Gerald Ronson. His name was found on a list of potential funders for Benjamin Netanyahu. He has 
such close links to the Israeli uh, government that he's had Israeli ministers visit him in jail. They've been appointed. Was, uh, they've been appointed to oversee uh, the prevention of increased anti-Semitic anti attacks in synagogues by the UK government just two weeks ago. I mean, absolutely. They are funded to the tune of, of, of many millions. Um, and let's not forget that when Michael Gove was, was education secretary and he set aside two million to fund the CST, he was actually on the board of advisors of the CST at the same time. And I think during the period of the Trojan horse as well, I think. Precisely. Yeah. You know, Michael Gove has been an absolute menace to the Muslim community in this country. And I think that you know, it has it has saddened me greatly the extent to which he has been able to really whitewash his reputation in the aftermath of Grenfell, particularly on this issue of uh, uh, building safety. But it's another topic. In terms of the CST, um, what they will focus on doing is drawing the, the goalposts and the guidelines. Mm -hmm. And what that will do is steer things closer to anti-Zionism being seen as a anti form of anti-Semitism. Anti it's the, the application of the IHRA. Yeah. Now, here's the thing. All government institutions have supposedly adopted the IHRA, okay? Why do you say supposedly? They have, in essence. But they haven't convicted anybody using that definition of anti-Semitism. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. That I know of, as of yet. Now the way for the right case. We, yeah, we're we're entering into the stage where the CPS is being explicitly publicly pressured by Suella Braverman to apply the IHRA in legal cases. You have key figures within the CPS being invited to take part in conferences in Israel and constantly being engaged by Israel lobby groups like the Board of Deputies and like the CST. How does and that relate to the current conversation that we're literally seeing on the day of the filming of this podcast where they're talking about an emergency meeting that took place with Suela Braverman yesterday uh, with... Um, Mark Rowley. Yeah, Mark Rowley. And they're talking about the meanings of jihad and that this needs to be defined for us to implement it and, and to prosecute um, the black flag. In relation, relation to a demo held by Hizb al -Tahrid, how does that relate to what we're talking about here? Well, so what you're seeing is pressure being exacted upon key government institutions mm -hmm. like the police and like the CPS to push this line, which is as narrow a space for Muslims to operate in this country as possible, and particularly on the issue of Palestine, for it to become even more a red line than it has been for all these years. You know, we've all seen people lose work, lose jobs, lose opportunities because of supporting the Palestinian people. Um, undoubtedly, this period of time will lead to a greater funding of those forces that want to narrow that space but also you know we, we, I'm, I'm sure we'll see those among our number enter the prisons within the next year or two for their support for palestine moving on to now the media right uh, the western corporate zionist media pr 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 primarily in the western world primarily in the english language uh, has been on warpath bro i mean there's been insane claims the 40 beheaded babies has been uh, debunked it's just fake news we're still waiting for uh, primary source evidence for the 260 that were killed in the rave um you know we had uh, david lammy you posted that video initially talking about israeli babies were raped um, Piers Morgan refusing to uh, condemn uh, Israel for the killing of Palestinian children in Gaza when hijab uh, posed it to him. Uh, we've seen backtracking from CNN reporters, BBC reporters about saying that we report that there were pro-Hamas protests. We've seen a madness happening online and I believe that one of the wins that the pro-Palestine side have had this time around has certainly been online. Um, why has it been so relentless? Okay, so I think what we need to do is look at the genocidal impulses which were never truly reckoned with in our society during the war on terror years because we are talking about the direct application of the idea of collective punishment mm -hmm. which according to common article 33 of the geneva conventions is a war, war crime. crime the basis for the invasion of afghanistan the basis for the invasion of iraq both of them were collective punishment you are speaking about selling to a population the idea that because of a certain number of people suffering because of X, Y, Z, threat inflation is pumped to such a level that therefore you have to visit upon 
a large population of millions of people a hostile military occupation. And so there was essentially um, a passive consent, at least passive, and in some cases active consent given to that policy. So what it means is that you had this latent genocidal impulse, particularly within the political and the media class. And I think that we did not really, especially the way that the retreat from Afghanistan went out with sort of cringe and whimper, we didn't really take that time to investigate it and, and, and critically engage with it and bring it out. Mm -hmm. But we've seen it on full display now. Now, in terms of understanding the events of October 7th, I believe that there are some key sources which are not being given adequate attention in the English language. Like? So, for example, on October 10th, you had an interview air on Israeli state radio with Yasmin Porat. She was a survivor from the Kibbutz Be'eri. Now, her husband had been killed in the process of being taken captive with 12 others. However, what followed was shelling by the Israeli military, which killed those 12 other captives, and she survived. What you also have is the important work of Amos Harel in Haaretz newspaper. Now, his long piece investigating what he describes as the failure in Israel's intelligence agencies to stop what happened on October 7th, he mentions General Brigadier Rosenfeld, and he talks about speaking to him just a week before the events of October 7th. In the article... And this is said by Amos Harrell. He says that when the Eretz crossing military base was seized, you had uh, General Brigadier Rosenfeld retreat into a room with other Israeli soldiers. Now, in that room, he was trying to organize opposition to the raid by the Palestinians. When he realized he could not succeed in that, he called in an airstrike, meaning he called for the Israeli military to strike its own military base. This is according to Amos Harrell in, in Haaretz newspaper. In addition to that, you have eyewitness accounts that were given to Nir Hassan in Haaretz, but also you have eyewitness accounts giving, given to Kiki Kirstenbaum in The Guardian, in which they speak specifically about Kibbutz Be'eri and it being bombed by Israeli tanks and Israeli, uh, no mention of jets, but mention of tank shelling and the deliberate targeting of the infrastructure of buildings, causing these buildings to be demolished. So when you look at footage that has come out of particularly Kibbutz Be'eri, you do not see the type of damage that could have been achieved with the weapons that those coming from Gaza had at the time. So then that brings into question when you take that also with the other piece of information that according to the health ministry in Gaza, 22 of the Israeli hostages captives have been, been killed, killed. Yep. by Israeli airstrikes. What you're talking about is the application of the Hannibal Directive, which Israel developed in Lebanon in the 80s. And it was a way of dealing with avoiding... People being taken hostage. People Isra being Israelis taken, Israelis being taken yeah. hostage. Now let's think about the case of Gilad Shalit. Okay, this soldier was worth over a thousand Palestinian political prisoners. One Israeli soldier. Okay, therefore, when you also look at the case of 2014 um, Operation Protective Edge, you saw an Israeli soldier by the name of Hadar Golding taken uh, prisoner. In that case. The Israeli military unleashed a savage attack on the Palestinians, killing hundreds in one go, including the Israeli soldier. Mm -hmm. This is the direct application of the Hannibal Directive. We need to see more about that. You see, recently, just in the past 24 hours, two Israeli captives have been released from Gaza, yep. and one of them, um, Levis is her second name, she spoke at length, her exact words, her exact words were... The Israelis bombed where we were. 
we were sacrificial lambs to the Israeli government. So therefore, my point of view is this. Israel has a history of lying constantly. Euromed Human Rights Monitor had footage and an investigation which found that the Israelis shot two Palestinians who were unarmed in that period. Our whole perception of the death toll is completely skewed because Israel claims to have the bodies of 1,500 Palestinians who came in on October 7th. So I still have those bodies. It also is apparent that they've killed over 5,000 people in Gaza. So our perception of the death toll is skewed. Also, this argument of self-defense is completely, completely discredited so when why, you think about why, why was this so consistent cross party across all the the senior politicians from Keir Starmer to Sunak to shadow ministers because they facilitated is Israel's lying you know when they killed Shirin Abu Akhla the journalist the mm -hmm. Al Jazeera journalist in Jenin what happened you had a, at least a year of lying and then eventually in September 2022 Israel acknowledged it on yep. the same day that they killed 30 Palestinians in Gaza so this is, you have a pattern of behaviour. Why do you think there's 29 UN workers have been killed since 7th of October? Uh, you've had uh, a Reuters journalist, uh, Isam, I forgot his second name. Isam Abdullah. Yeah. Isam Abdullah was killed, yet they don't mention who the killers were. In or the who press the, releases. Or, yeah, or, and who, was, who would most probably be the likely perpetrator. Why, why do you think that is? Why well, is there such a consistent denial in mentioning or even pointing any fault at Israel? Well, why is it so consistent across party, mainstream media? Why, why, is it, why are they so united on this issue? I mean, in the case of UNRWA, what you have is an organization called UN Watch, which relentlessly, relentlessly harasses UN agencies. You know, for instance, I know of people that wanted to teach in Gaza who, because UN Watch sent in opposition to them, mm -hmm. UNRWA uh, were not able to employ that person. Inside Gaza, you had people being blacklisted with UN agencies because of this Israel lobby group, which is headed by a key figure at the INSS, which is an Israel intelligence uh, think tank. Um, and UN Watch is constantly using its position to try and, you know, and, and it's one of the more effectively named Israel lobby groups because it, it can give the impression that it is sort of uh, somehow neutral, mm -hmm. but essentially it's an Israel lobby group. Um, in the case of Reuters, I don't know the partic particular lever of pressure that exists there. He was killed in South Lebanon while he was doing a report. Uh, there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I know of the case of, of Isam Abdullah, but in terms of where it is they are able to pressure Reuters, I do not know. But without a doubt, there will be a line of engagement or a channel of engagement which is constantly applying pressure to them. Um, and I think would probably be likely to say to Reuters, we have not issued a statement about this, so therefore you cannot categorically state that this is what okay, happened. Yes. Despite the fact that he was a Reuters employee, despite the fact that he was surrounded by journalists, despite the fact that everyone knows it was only the Israelis that could have killed him. I saw headlines like fire from the direction yeah. of Israel. Bonkers, bruv. Yeah, absolutely. So, so, so this is the kind of the, the information infrastructure that we are trying to operate in and trying to assert Palestinian rights in. So, so let's stay on this subject. We've, we've discussed somewhat on a cursory level the mainstream corporate media. Let's now talk about social media. Let's talk about alternative media influences. <clears throat> Primarily, in this case, we want to touch upon Jordan Peterson, um, Ben Shapiro. Um, not so much about the neutrality of, of, of Andrew Tate, but primarily those two, the Daily Wire, we saw a lot come, a lot of hot air coming from Matt Walsh. Uh, these were people literally calling for genocide, bruv. Um, what do you say about the initial... Pop let's, let, let me get your thoughts on this first. What, what was your thoughts on the initial popularity of Peterson amongst some within the Muslim community and how quickly that changed when his true colours came out? So, Israel? so the Roy Institute published a study in mm -hmm. 2011 and the Roy Institute is a key Israel Israeli intelligence think tank so it it does a lot of the thinking that later is applied um, in important places 
and it identified London as the hub of the hub of the hubs of delegitimization of Israel. And it made a distinction between two types of people that care about the Palestinian cause. The first type was the critic, and the second type was the delegitimizer. Now, according to the Roy Institute, the delegitimizer should be shut down everywhere possible. They should not have any platform ever. The critic should be subject to strategic engagement strategy. Now, we have several organizations in this country. Red with for Londa, the delegitimizers. Delegitimizers, absolutely. Proudly. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> but the, the, <laughs> the critics, the critics um, are subject to sophisticated engagement strategies, which take several different shapes. There's a few different organizations. We've mentioned some of them already, but there's more. You say Mehdi Hassan would fall under critic? Absolutely. Okay. Cle I mean, very clearly. Okay. Very clearly. But just so the people know in it. Because they might yeah. be thinking, okay, if you guys are delegitimizers, then who's a critic that there has to be a kind of a caution, safe strategy to engage yeah. within a very restricted framework? Precisely. You, okay. And I mean, MSNBC, the, the, the key thing that I think not enough um, attention has been, uh, has been given to is... Um, uh, uh, the executive, senior executive producer there is somebody who was in the Israeli intelligence corps and he produces Al Sharpton's show on MSNBC. Now, MSNBC allowed him to produce the channel's coverage of the 2006 war in Lebanon. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine? I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. But in terms of this, this case of uh, what we're talking about with Peterson and Ben Shapiro, I think the way I answer questions can sometimes come across as sort of tangential, but there is an ultimate destination of where I'm trying to get to. Now, <laughs> my, 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 belief, my belief is that for a particular period, Peterson was one prong of a strategic engagement strategy, which was launched by the Shapiro thrust. Now, before we understand Peterson, I think we should just look at Ben Shapiro and his own sort of trajectory. In the early 2000s, he wrote an article which has now been wiped from the yep. internet, but we have been able to uh, get it through the Wayback Machine, in which he calls for the mass expulsion yep. of Palestinians. Um, he says land transfer is not genocide, we need to stop being squeamish. So ultimately, that is his perception. He also and this will potentially lead us further down into this question of the Temple Mount movement. He is a believer in the Temple Mount idea, the idea that the... The destruction of Al-Aqsa. And the establishment of the Third Temple. Now, what has funded Ben Shapiro's escapades across these years? So I'll say what we know. What we know is that he was a Shilman Fellow at the David Horowitz Freedom Center. David Horowitz is a very well-known and aggressive Israel lobbyist on campuses in the United States for many, many years. The, the person that funded his fellowship is Robert Shillman. Robert Shillman is a funder of the Zionist Organization of America. He is somebody who was on the board of the Friends of the IDF charity at the same time that he funded Ben Shapiro. It's also, incidentally, the same time that Tommy Robinson was a Shillman Fellow at the David Horowitz Freedom Center. This was something revealed by Lucy Brown, who was an assistant to uh, Tommy Robinson. Uh, the details of the agreement with Shillman were, were, were revealed. And this was the time when Tommy Robinson had the most social media traction that he ever had. He had a Facebook page gaining millions yeah. of followers. TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. It was everywhere. It was firing it was everywhere. everywhere. When he was describing us as combatants. Yeah. So what he's, what he's, and this is the key it's thing. It's when he wrote understand. the book on the Quran. Yes. It's during that period. Which, which would have had, uh, it would have essentially been ghostwritten for him. But he, he spoke, he said, the people in these houses are combatants. Now, the use of that language is attempting to legally justify the killing of those people. That's, that's yep. the thing we have to be clear about. And so that was backed by somebody who was on the board of the Friends of the IDF at the same time. 
Anyway, Ben Shapiro, following on from that, went on to help set up the Prager University YouTube channel, very uh, successful YouTube channel. Dennis Prager himself is an Israel lobbyist. He's absolutely honest and clear about that. And the director of that company is Marissa Strait, who is formerly uh, an agent in Unit 8200 in the Israeli military intelligence. Right, we've gone back to Unit, unit, unit 800. 800. There's, there's a lot more. There's a lot more there that we can talk about also. But Ben Shapiro and Jer Jeremy Bowring helped set up Prager University. And then you have the Daily Wire, which was founded by Ben Shapiro and Jeremy Bowring. What you also have is now John Lewis, the chief operating officer of Daily Wire, is former uh, US military intelligence. So... It looks very much like it's some form of a PSYOP when we think of Ben Shapiro. Aria Lightstone is the U.S. Um, special envoy for normalization. So it's a U.S. government employee mm -hmm. who works to increase the economic integration. And this is the key thing about the Abraham Accords, is that it was about economic integration between uh, these particular states and Israel's because it increases the stickiness of that uh, bond. He described Ben Shapiro as a personal friend. On the same day that Jordan Peterson published his message to Muslims, Muslims. Ben Shapiro interviewed Aria Lightstone um, on his own podcast about the Abraham Accords. So it seems very much like there was a push that Jordan Peterson was at least integrated into, initiated into as a part of it. Um, we also know that he has uh, links as well to a Canadian Israel lobby group, uh, the Abraham Global Peace Initiative. It's mad how they use Ibrahim alayhi salam for all these nefarious agendas, you know that? Absolutely. And that's why Absolutely. we need to keep our eye on interfaith uh, projects of this nature, because they'll come on the Abrahamic one and it's just purely a Zionist front. It'll just be a Zionist super light. And, and, and the reason why the Muslim community needs to know that, because when they... We know this. Interfaith is an age-old strategy, counter-terrorism strategy from the time of Blair, actually. And they come with Abrahamic three faiths as one and all that kind of stuff with really essentially to normalize the Muslim community's relations with Zionist entities, but at the same time pacifying our solidarity with, with our brothers and sisters in Philistine. So we need to be aware of that. We yeah, and, and, and also complicate passions. So... so, so, so complicate it with a personal intimacy that says well casting doubts casting doubt inserting certain narratives yeah it's a it's a complicated psychological process which yeah. has been visited upon uh us in this country but also is being rolled out in different places and the key issue with what we're talking about today with ben shapiro is that the daily wire is sponsored by express vpn now the uh, the sole owner of ExpressVPN is Cape Technologies and the CEO of Cape Technologies is Ido Ehrlich. Ido Ehrlich comes from the Duvdivan unit. He's a veteran of the Duvdivan unit in the Israeli military known as Mustarabin. They are the people that go into Palestinian communities mm -hmm. that appear as Palestinians, that kidnap Palestinians, that imprison Palestinians. Some of them are more long-term you have Mr. Arabin that integrate themselves into Palestinian society. That really the only coverage... A couple of years ago, about 20, 20 of them got gripped in Gaza and they got exposed. Do you not remember? I remember that. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Uh, now, the, the, the interesting thing is mm -hmm. that within the media, the only coverage that I've seen look at Mr. Arabin properly is an episode of the Sanduq al-Aswad, which was a documentary series on Al Jazeera, where they even followed... These Mr. Arabin who had had children with Palestinians. And then, and then, you know, it's even alleged in that documentary, which again, this is Al Jazeera's assertion, not mine, that there were Mr. Arabin among the people that fled or were ethnically cleansed and displaced in 1948 into the camps. So, you know, you're They've really... They've been there since. Yeah. And that documentary is publicly available, Sandur Al-Aswad, in uh, Mr. Arabin. 
in Arabic on YouTube. Check it out. They follow some of these figures to their, some of them went to Brazil after causing uh, damage in the Palestinian communities and Al Jazeera followed them and tried to get interviews with them, tried to knock on their doors. I mean, amazing. But in terms of the English language, there is absolutely minimal information about this as a um, as a as an issue. Shapiro, so, yeah. on, like, carry on, finish, finish on Shapiro. Yeah, so what I would say is essentially with Jordan Peterson, he was integrated into that wider project, which was about softening um, people's perceptions um, of Israel. Um, obviously, he was deeply patronizing in the way that he presented it. Ah, so you're saying that the Muslim engagement part and appealing to those things about masculinity, anti feminism, which in the era of the culture wars and which has affected Muslims and been very loud about it, that was actually used to kind of perhaps, we're not, we're not saying unequivocally or conclusively, yeah, we're saying yeah. it could potentially be yeah, yeah. that the engagement with the Muslims, which uh, many took to, was actually for this wider objective. I mean, and as we've seen, essentially, it's happened, he, he it? has the genocidal impulse. Yeah, you know, give once, him hell. And once we recognize that genocidal impulse, this is clarity. Dreams so, of nuclear war. We can be thankful for that clarity at this stage. We've also had examples of Israeli official accounts making some major blunders. When the Al-Ahli hospital was bombed, uh, they issued a tweet with a video which they claimed was the evidence that uh, it was a Hamas or, or resistance rocket uh, that actually attacked the Al-Ahli hospital. Then they edited that in 22 minutes, they removed the video. We had uh, Hanayana Naftali. This guy was, the. I think Netanyahu was at his wedding, his best man. He, he was appointed by him to report directly from IDF military bases. He's a, he's, I would say he's as close as an official social media commentator for the Israeli entity as anyone would. He, uh, within minutes of the attack, he posted uh, breaking. Israeli Air Force struck a Hamas terrorist base inside a hospital in Gaza. A multiple, multiple number of terrorists are dead. And then he goes on to blaming Hamas. This was this was deleted. It went viral. He then had to issue a cl clarification statement saying Israel would never bomb a hospital. It could only have been Hamas, and I mistakenly posted this. So we've seen major on goals, uh, edited polls, deleted polls. What's going on? So when looking at specifically the bombing which took place at Al Ahli Baptist Hospital, we have to first look at a pattern of behaviour. So. Number one, Israel has stated equivocally that it will bring down a Shifa hospital in Gaza. During this campaign, it has bombed a Durra hospital with white phosphorus. It bombed this particular hospital at Ahli on Saturday. It then sent a warning on Sunday. Yep. It then sent a warning on Monday. It then sent a warning on Tuesday. And then the bombing happened. Which the Patriot now, confirmed the phone calls were made. Precisely. You know, this 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 hospital, very old hospital, is administered by the Anglican Church Man. based in based in Jerusalem. And the interesting point here is that you have Hanania Naftali and his his tweet. This is somebody who was a digital spokesman for Israel, someone's social media advisor to Netanyahu. Yep. He would have been someone that knew about these things. Then we take the next piece of information, which is that Israel put out a video, and one of the videos they put out were actually from 2022. Yeah. That was deleted. Then we look at the call that Israel put out, which was supposedly of Palestinian fighters inside Gaza, explicitly stating that it came from the cemetery. Okay? Now, earshot... That was rejected by two Arabic-speaking independent experts. Yeah, and in addition to that, um, uh, Earshot, which is a company that specializes in sound engineering, examined the recording and found it had been recorded on two separate channels. So if this was the interception of a phone call, mm. it would be on one channel. It would not be on two separate channels. In addition to that, Earshot found that the audio channels had been moved and edited. Sound effects had been put on those audio channels. Okay. Let's take the next piece of information. Forensic Architecture, an organization based here, 
headed by Eyal Wiseman, an Israeli academic whose books I actually think are great. He found, and forensic architecture found, when they investigated the place where the, uh, the bombing had taken place, that the way it had struck the ground implies that it came from a direction other than the cemetery. And in addition to that, the cemetery, um, the cemetery narrative is also contradicted by the videos that the Israelis put out. Yep. So what you're seeing is an untrustworthy party that has a history of lying about these things. I'll give you another really important example. But these people are quite major blunders and they seem like they were very uh, trigger happy to release this information, but this time around here and there, they got caught. Yeah. That's what it feels like. Otherwise, otherwise this would be a uh, normal protocol. So I'll give you another example of the way this functioned in 2022. When you had the war on Gaza during that period, mm -hmm. you saw four or five Palestinian children killed at the grave of their grandfather. And I'm not sure if you saw the footage, if others saw the footage, these, it was no longer a human what had been done to this boy. Yeah, he was flat. Israel at first claimed the same thing, that it was fire from the Palestinian side. The Associated Press even echoed that claim, saying it looks like it was the case. And they even said a third of those that had been killed in Gaza were because of these misfired rockets. What did I discover? that those three journalists from the Associated Press had all published articles at the Times of Israel. Times of Israel, headed by a different David Horowitz, who is a former Israeli soldier, who has been lauded by Naftali Bennett, former Israeli prime minister, the genocidal thug of a prime minister, Naftali Bennett, who has called his journalism a special opportunity for Israel. There's more there. Seth Klarman, the funder mm -hmm. of Times of Israel, funded the David Horowitz Freedom Center, which employed Tommy Robinson funds uh, settlements, funds the same group of Israel lobby groups that we're used to, the Roy Institute, ADL, etc. So to me, that looked wrong. Why would you have the Associated Press just a year after their offices had been bombed by the Israeli military in Gaza, mm -hmm. publishing an article, reproducing and regurgitating this Sim Israeli similar topic. vibes from 2022 and in 2023 you have lo and behold the associated press coming out with an article and uh two of these journalists that wrote this article have also published work with the times of israel previously what was claimed on the twitter community notes which i had to battle with to try and get a clarification is that because ap is a wire service the times of israel republished these articles but I would imagine, I would imagine that the Times of Israel, if it was opposed in publishing those articles by those individuals, would not have been not able, able to. Exactly. So that indicates a conflict of interest in my personal mm. uh, opinion. So what we're talking about, as you've laid out here, is a, a whole, the anatomy of, of lying to justify the cruelty towards millions of people on an industrial scale in a daily way. And ultimately what they're trying to do is set traps and get us distracted in minor details of different little incidents in order to derail the wider issue, which is about 75 years of Palestinians being dispossessed and ultimately the goal of Israel, which is a maximalist strategy. You know, let's not forget this issue of the Sinai Desert and putting the Palestinians there is not a new idea. Israeli political figures that and military figures my idea to push them into the Sinai. have been talking about it. They've been talking about it. They've been talking about Egypt absorbing Gaza and Jordan, and Jordan absorbing, absorbing the West Bank. Bank. Right? It's not us saying that. That's Israeli political well and military figures. Precisely. So now we're at a stage where... They want to actualise that now. They are, they are actualising. Yeah, they're actualising, yeah. So given that, and you said that one... You were talking about distractions from this wider agenda and wider objective which they're enacting right now as we speak with the military assistance of the British and the American governments, amongst others. Uh, a narrative in the media, still staying on the, to on the topic of media, has been about condemnation. We've seen this before, right? It, it, was, it dominated the entire media engagement of the war on terror period, right? 
uh, to condemn what Hamas has done, to condemn what the resistance has done to, you know, the 40 beheaded babies, the, the mass rapes of elderly and ravers and party goers. You know, the stories were endless. Yet we've seen some level of consistency from Palestinian representatives, even those who would be on an opposing ideological spectrum to Hamas and some of the factions in Gaza. Why has this condemnation framework, uh, do you consider that to be one of the traps? Absolutely. Of course, it's one of the traps. In 2021, the law was changed in this country to say that any support for either the military or political wing of this particular organization was a crime and people yeah. go to jail for it. So they are deliberately setting traps for people. They are weaponizing people's own natural aversion to seeing human suffering against them. You know, we have to remember that the British Parliament has a statue, statue of Nelson Mandela outside it. He spent 27 years in prison defined as a terrorist. Yep. Margaret Thatcher and others called for his execution. Okay? The ANC were a terrorist organisation. The ANC did kill children and did kill civilians. Children who were collaborators in some cases had tyres put around their neck and were killed. Okay, Are we now saying that in a situation where Human Rights Watch, uh, Harvard uh, School of Law, where Amnesty International, Beit Salem, Beit Salem these organisations are defining Israel as, as an apartheid, apartheid. state. Yep. The establishment of a dual legal <coughs> system fits the UN definition of apartheid, the war crime of apartheid. The wall in the West Bank, according to the, an advisory opinion given by the International uh, Criminal Court was illegal in 2004. For 20 years, that has still been standing. So we also know that paragraph 6, article 39 of the Geneva Convention directly prohibits the colonizing of land and the moving of people from the occupying country into that land. That has happened. You have around 500 Israeli settlements, illegal Israeli settlements in the West Bank. You have around 300 checkpoints. You have 144 Israeli military bases built in the West Bank along this period. How is this okay? How can anyone look at this situation and say, well, it started on October 7th? No, it didn't. No, it didn't. Palestinians in Gaza, okay, have a 23% infant mortality rate. That's a 20 times difference between children born in Israel. The United Nations specifically blames the blockade on causing that issue of infant mortality in Gaza. 95% of the water in Gaza is unfit for human consumption. 70% of the people are refugees in Gaza. According to Article 11 of UN Resolution 194, the Palestinians have the right to return home. What happened when they tried that in 2018? What happened to those people? Got killed. They got killed. Ibrahim Abu Thuraya. This was a man who had already lost his legs in an Israeli airstrike. He went on the Great March of Return and he I was, was snipered. Yep. He was snipered with components. Components of the snipers came from Britain. Okay? They killed the medic Razan Najjar in oh, direct yes, violation of Rule 25 of the IR, uh, the, the International uh, Committee of the Red Cross. Medics should be treated as civilians. They killed Yasser Murtaja in direct, uh, direct violation of Geneva Conventions that say journalists should be treated as civilians. He had press written across his chest. We're talking about a concentration camp of two million people. It is very, very easy. It's very, very easy to, for us to pontificate about what we would or wouldn't do in situations when we are not in those situations. Now, even this issue of the designation of particular groups in particular ways, okay, in this country, that group is designated that way, okay? This is a government that represents the millions of people here. In the United States, that organization is designated that way. It's about 360 million people, okay? In the European Union, designated that way. In Japan, designated that way. That's less than a billion people. Mm -hmm. In Switzerland, the most neutral of countries, it's not designated that way, okay? That's about 9 million people. In Pakistan, it's not designated that way. 215 million. Venezuela, not designated that way. Turkey, not designated that way. China, not designated that way. 1.4 billion people. 
yeah, a fifth of humanity. Billions of people around the world are represented by governments who do not have that same designation, okay? You have a situation where more people in the world are represented by governments who do not see this issue in the same way. Actually, they understand themselves as post-colonial subjects. It's a very basis of the United Nations Charter that the, the, the acquisition of land, the acquisition of land through invasion is wrong. That's a key basis at the United Nations, that decolonization was a positive process. What you have happening in Palestine is colonialism. Settler colonialism is the, 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 the seizing of resources. 80% of the clean water in the West Bank is used by the settlers rather than used by the Palestinians. You tell us that history started on the 7th of October, then all you tell us is you know nothing about history and you've read not even a scintilla of a book about the cause. So why is it such a major issue? If you're saying that uh, the decolonization of occupied lands is something that's enshrined in under the UN, is that what you're saying? Yeah, right? in the UN Charter, the, the, it's understood, yeah. Just as it is for the right for uh, occupied people to violently resist in Protocol 1 of the Geneva Convention 1949, yeah? There's many of these resolutions, there's many of these uh, stipulates. My, my understanding is it's a UN resolution. UN resolution. That, 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 that assures the right of people that are occupied by a foreign entity to, uh, to liberate themselves in all ways, including armed resistance. So, but what I'm saying is that what does this what does any of this mean that when people actually do that in yeah. this specific case when muslims do that when yeah. palestinians do that mm -hmm. why does it become an issue of then terrorism we've seen that time and time and again we, we cite these uh, resolutions to say that look they have the right all we're really exposing is the glaring hypocrisy yeah if anything yeah yeah Be because every time we talk about us vetoing certain things uh, in the security council uh, meetings when it comes to favoring israel there's like yeah. 20 30 vetoes historic if not more yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we talk about these resolutions about war crimes uh, not transgressing international laws of um, engagement of war um, the right to violently resist occupation we talk yeah. about these things but when it's actually uh, given a chance yeah. by the people in question yeah. that too becomes a problem yeah and they are called terrorists they're yeah. designated in particular ways so i'm just saying that how do we get out of this conundrum where there's citations in international law and, and un charters and resolutions but on the other hand the implementation of such resolutions is little to nothing it just seems like hot air for us to reference citations in international law for it to never actually fairly be implemented on the, on, on the people i i think there's still ways that we can advocate for the cause and we have to find those ways and we have to be active um in those ways essentially the, the 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 power of language and the 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 classification of of people essentially establishes a hierarchy of political subjectivity and there is a place that the palestinians have which has a certain level of rightlessness and really what we're seeing is the attempt to put the rest of us in a uh, not similar but in also a space of rightlessness, you know, and that's something that for a society that's been fed this, uh, this idea of there being a cancel culture, there is no people more cancelled in the history of humanity, probably than the Palestinians. Um, they have been cancelled in every way fathomable. Um, and, you know, therefore, I believe that there must be something that can compel people around sure. the world to connect with it. You know, we also have to remember that where we are is not um, is not reflective of the rest of the world. Absolutely. You know, the love for Palestine is is especially especially even, I was even in non-Muslim, many non-Muslim countries, mm -hmm. definitely. Yeah. To to appeal to it from a perspective outside of. Uh, the religious source text, the Quran yeah. and the Sunnah and stuff like this, they will appeal to, I guess, UN resolutions where things are enshrined and protected, which applies to the Palestinians. Well, but when they see the hypocritical in, implementation, in, in, in they'll the, speak up for it. I mean, in the case of S South Africa, they apply it not only to understanding that during apartheid, Israel not only helped uh, the South African apartheid government develop nuclear mm. weapons, it armed it, it built fences for it, it built electrified uh, It was involved fences. and immersed in it, bro. Immersed in it, precisely. Um, I mean, and even you had former uh, president of South Africa, apartheid South Africa, say Israel's like us, an apartheid state. We're talking about decades before Amnesty International and the rest of the World Cup. Bringing the podcast to a close. Yes. Um, 
we spoke a lot about um, you know the wider agenda uh, and what's being enacted as we're unfolding in front of our eyes, and that's to push the Palestinians of Gaza into the Sinai. And this was always a long-term, long-held position of the founding fathers of Zionism. On the other side, we have Masjid al-Aqsa. Yeah. The reason why millions, and, and, and I'm saying this, I'm being quite conservative, not tens of millions, Indonesia, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Turkey, Iraq, um, Lebanon, across the Maghreb, across the breadth of the Muslim majority world, with exception to a handful of Khaliji states, millions took to the streets. They they took to the streets not because they know about the intricacies of an apartheid state, not because BT Salam or Human Rights Watch and Amnesty told them that this is an apartheid state. It's in they, defense of the first Qibla. Sah. It moved because of the sanctity of Masjid al-Aqsa and al-Quds Sharif. Tell me more about what you mentioned earlier about plans to actually demolish this and to build the third temple and the various uh, entities involved in this so my source for this is an israeli army radio investigation in 2013 and what you have to understand about the development of the temple mount movement is that there was an an, an antagonism between the movement and between the israeli military for several decades until it reached the point it reached uh, around 2016. So the Temple Mount movement believe that there should be established a temple in the place of the Al-Aqsa compound, mm -hmm. that it should be demolished and replaced with this temple. The entire complex. Should be demolished and replaced. I mean, I don't rule out the possibility of it being done in a piecemeal attritional way. I mm -hmm. think that's very likely, but the ultimate goal is complete obliteration mm -hmm. and replacement. Now, as I say, my source for this is an Israeli army investigation. Now, they found not only, not only was the Israeli Ministry of Culture and the Israeli Ministry of Education funding the Temple Mount Institute, which is an organization which explicitly calls for the demolishing of these two masjids and the replacement with the Jewish temple. It also, it also found that as an alternative to conscription within the Israeli military, women were being able to join the Temple Mount Institute through the Israeli government. So th this is how deeply the Israeli government is involved in this project. It is allowing it as an alternative to military conscription. I mean, this is really significant. This is now, basically, in, in simpleton terms, about you're basically saying to create rogue elements of vigilante militias to carry out the job at that time, at that time, rogue, mm. but at this time, but now, not. No, no, not official. Since really. Gilad Erdan, yeah, um, there was an integration of the Temple Mount movement with the Israeli military. So, whereas previously you had Temple Mount figures attempt to blow up Al Aqsa and then being stopped by the Israeli military, now you have the Israeli military facilitating their passage into it, facilitating the, you know, and supposedly this is under the sovereignty of Jordan and the uh, the status quo agreement says that this should not be happening, but there's uh, complete impotence on the side of any of the, the, uh, the local neighboring regional powers. But my point in saying this is it wasn't only the ministry of education and the ministry of culture it was also the deputy defense minister who was found uh, was funding uh, this organization and it's just one of the organizations out of uh, a plethora of organizations who deeply are invested in this long-term project unfortunately we are very reactive to things that are being done we feel things being done to us we see them being done to us and we speak out when they happen what we don't do is we don't strip the situation of emotion as much as possible think strategically and think long term in particular objectives and unfortunately the zionist movement has always always had a maximalist strategy and always built towards that in uh, different ways and this is one example of it but absolutely the the consequences of such a move would be calamitous for the whole of humanity bringing the podcast to a close do you remember back in 2020 when you came on i started the episode by asking you uh, revered and celebrated arab figures and to give your thoughts on it do you remember yeah i'm going to close today's podcast <laughs> by asking you some thoughts on um, states and entities 
and I want you to just give me your honest thoughts as brief as possible, Kareem. Yeah, yeah. Um, in relation to the subject of Gaza and the Today, Palestinian yeah, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. The Palestinian Authority. The Palestinian Authority essentially kills and imprisons Palestinians for Israel. It is the the control of it in a day-to-day -day way is outsourced to British intelligence cutouts like the Adam Smith um, uh, Institute. You also, Adam Smith International, sorry, it's different from Institute. What you also see is the way in which Palestinian Authority forces are trained. The Israelis, for example, stipulated that they couldn't be trained in the use of sniper rifles. They could only be used, trained in the use of things that could be used from close range. Um, also, what you see is something that Mahmoud Abbas um, calls Muqaddas. Uh, he calls the Tansiq al-Amni, which is the security coordination between the Palestinian Authority and Israel as sacred. Um, so essentially it was, and it's also the largest employer in the West Bank. So it was a way... It keeps his people in a job and paid. Exactly. And it was a way for Israel to create a comprador class of Palestinians that would be willing, even if ineffectively, to do the bidding of the Israeli occupier. And that is what you have seen with the arming of the West Bank and with Arin al Asud and other organizations developing. The main impediment, the main impediment to what they do in the West Bank has been the Palestinian Authority. A two state solution on the 1967 borders. I'm not a Palestinian, so I think it's not my place to necessarily impose my point of view on Your Palestinians. Thoughts. In my Your personal feelings. opinion, in my personal opinion, it has been a subterfuge. This process has been a subterfuge for the building up of settlers in the West Bank and the ethnic cleansing of Palestinians from their land. The 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 right of return and Al-Aqsa are supposedly part of the final status negotiations, meaning that you left these negotiations to later on down the line, when actually those are the core issues we're talking about. The right of return and Al-Aqsa are key to the entire issue of uh, Palestine. And so, you know, the Palestinian Authority, as it was created, has really been a bodyguard for the Israeli occupation. And that, what you've just mentioned, was the subterfuge through which that uh, situation was uh, produced. Turkey under Erdogan's leadership. In my personal opinion, you know, there are ways in which Turkey offers diplomatic assistance uh, to the Palestinians. Um, I, I understand the emotional uh, connection. I love Turkey as a country. Unfortunately, the uh, deals which do exist with Israel, I would say, are an impediment to Turkey being able to act um, effectively on uh, this issue. I think there is definitely a wide contingent within Turkish society who would want to break off relations with the Israelis immediately tomorrow. There are ways in which the Turks have, the Turkish state has been able to um, expose particular um, particular plans of uh, the Israelis. So, for instance, uh, Tamir Mishal, uh, Palestinian uh, journalist for Al Jazeera, has a fantastic show, Ma Khafi Adam. And within it, within the last six months or so, they had a show revealing Mossad operations in Turkey aimed at those who are related to uh, Palestinian factions. Um, and, and, you know, that came... Certainly the source of that was Turkish intelligence. So I'm not saying it's a simple uh, relationship, and I do believe there are some positives there. However, overall, um, right now, you have to break all relations and you have to expel the ambassadors immediately. And, and, and that goes for every single state that has any type of diplomatic involvement with Israel. Qatar. Uh, Qatar is a... Uh, is an interesting player on the on the international stage undoubtedly they're playing um, a role as we speak in the potential release of israeli hostages absolutely um they you know al jazeera is is something to really marvel at as an achievement of a a state that's very small that has a smaller economy than you know m most most of the big players um, but through Al Jazeera, it's able to play a very important role. And the space is still there within it to seriously investigate 
what the Israelis are doing, and you know, and for that, that's 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 a brilliant thing. Um, I can't speak for all of its foreign policy because I don't know all of its foreign policy, um, but I think that it has been able to use its way. Undoubtedly, undoubtedly, no one no one is in a position to doubt that Qatar has worked to support the Palestinian cause. It has Saudi normalization. Would you say that the events of 7th of October is was actually directly or indirectly linked to the normalization process? I think they've had very interesting messaging um, because they've sort of constantly been bombarding the public with conflicting messages. One of support <laughs> and solidarity and colonization, one, and, of, uh, one of staying quiet. And one of breaking relations and yeah. one of stopping normalization and then, and then not. So what we can actually say is that normalization has already happened. You know, the presence of Pegasus spyware on Jamal Khashoggi's phone mm. and the use of that. And you have to remember that Jamal Khashoggi was working with Wikistrat, which is an Israeli private intelligence uh, firm, which uh, Catherine Shakdam was an employee of mm -hmm. also. Now, Jamal Khashoggi, the question is, was Wikistrat working with Jamal Khashoggi? Or was it spying and working on Jamal Khashoggi? If simultaneous to that, the Pegasus was inside its phone, which essentially, let's be clear, is outsourcing the intelligence functions of the external intelligence agencies of a country to Israel. Absolutely, Pegasus is a, a, a NSO is an arm. It's, nu it's of nucleus the is government. Israel. Yes, the central nerve. And the information nucleus, goes yes. back to Israel. Israel. And 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 the biggest proof, right? The the, the thing that NSO claim is, oh, we don't have any access to to what's seized through mm. these people's phone. Sherry Blair, who's on the board of Pegasus of uh, NSO, reached out to one of the daughters of, uh, one of uh, I think the wives of someone in Dubai and said, you know that they're accessing your phone, they're hacking your phone. How would Sherry Blair know that? If NSO had no access, right? And so, and so it's been found that NSO is an arm of the Israeli government. So if Saudi were using that at that time, if on top of it, at the same time they say they broke off uh, relations, um, you had the Saudis investing in key hedge funds that were based around Israeli companies, then what you have to say is that it has been going on, but there is a fairly successful campaign to disguise it. Last but not least, and the reason why I saved Iran till the end is because it's very unique in how it fits into the current war. Um, Sunni's, um, uh, Iran's PR in the Sunni world uh, has not been great uh, due to the Syrian war and its unequivocal backing of Bashar. Um, same with Hezbollah. Hezbollah is not the sweetheart of the Sunni world as it was in 2006 because of Syria. Um, there would be some theological and sectarian discomfort in the Sunni world to give Iran credit or even merely even acknowledging its uh, assistance to the Palestinian cause. Um, there'll be those who'll say, irrespective of their help, they cannot be trusted. Irrespective of whatever they're doing, we will not forget Syria. Irrespective of what they're doing, there's historical premise, sectarian argument. There's a historical premise of treachery. Um, they talk about Al-Fajr Al -Fajr missiles, but not one Iranian revolutionary guard has stepped into Israel. Um, don't overplay their hands. Yes, they might have helped the resistance, but you know we give them too much. There's all of these various arguments that exist amongst the majority Sunni masses in the West and in the Muslim world. What's your thoughts on Iran in this particular so context? So where I would... Um where I would defer to would be the leadership of the factions that are involved in confrontation. Um, to have consistently praised and acknowledged Iran's support and help. And who have said this. Um, and what we have to be honest about is that were there not this deterrent force, Lebanon, South Lebanon would still be occupied by the Israelis. What we also have to be clear about is that in order for these organizations to defend themselves, they have relied, you know, it's documented, it's out there, their interviews can be accessed. The 
examples where this has become more available to the world is out there people can search it out absolutely but but that's the basis of how this particular chapter you know i'm 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 someone who's read enough that i know of a time when the uae funded the pflp <laughs> that's crazy <laughs> so the history of this story is complex but the simple fact of the matter is is that the ability of palestinians to defend themselves has been in the last few decades reliant upon iran and ask ourselves what iran has got in return for that support has it got a stable economy has it got a population which are getting access to the things they need in the way they need it's got international isolation it's got economic warfare it's got sanctions which kill its population it's got uh you know let, let's suppose that it was to let go of the palestinian cause what do you think would be the benefits a, to it a counter would be they got damascus they got the houthis in yemen they got hezbollah in uh, lebanon uh, they have friendly militia groups in very very senior positions in iraq They've but who else but who else has them in this context i mean they has them Gaza has them Gaza has them and when china for example set in place its policy over the next 10 to 20 years to invest 400 billion in iran what then happened and this is quite an important shift that took place is china then put pressure on the saudis to engage with yeah. particular but along with that yeah the guys behind them yeah now what that potentially does is solve a lot of the problems it, and and it hasn't lasted because essentially the ultimate direction of one of those parties we've already stated is where it is right however was that initiative to be successful which it seems to have calmed things down in Yemen which undoubtedly we all agree was the worst humanitarian catastrophe we've seen in Undeniable. our lifetime it, children dying 95,000 children dying from star starvation farms being bombed a thousand times you know which Britain and the US were key parties to essentially that was a British and US proxy war through the chinese initiative Yemen was calmed down potentially through the chinese initiative you would see the problems of lebanon calm down because you would see the saudi war against hezbollah in lebanon calm down now both lebanon and iran i would argue have faced really drastic economic warfare and the key reason the key reason is the support for palestine i would argue could be a conversation for another oh, yeah. day. Could be, could be, it sounds like a part three. Listen, <laughs> it's an absolute honor having you on Kareem. Thank you, brother. Honor to be here. Uh, Thank um, you. May Allah accept everything that you're doing. Uh, forgive our shortcomings. And Thank you, brother. You're a beacon of an example in terms of showing solidarity with our brothers and sisters in Palestine, mashallah. Uh, so you, carry on doing what you're doing. Thank you, bro. My dear brothers and sisters, I hope you all thoroughly enjoyed today's podcast as much as I did. I know there's a lot to go through. Um, everything that... Uh, Loki Kareem said in the podcast can be referenced. Um, if you tuned in via YouTube, remember to click subscribe. You can find this episode on all three seasons, all the major audio platforms. And until next time, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.